Morning from Midtown Cleveland, and thank you for joining us virtually on a sunny day here at our offices in the Agora on Euclid Avenue. I'm Richard Barga, Vice President of Economic Development for Midtown, and uh, thanks for joining another installment of Innovation Intersections. Uh, next slide, please. The series is designed to demystify the term innovation and invite our community to explore how we can intersect with these new and disruptive technologies. Today, we'll be hearing from the co-founder of Nottingham Spurk, John Nottingham. Um, next slide, please. A special thanks to our partners listed here who have helped us market and provide content for our upcoming events. Next slide. And uh, just a quick run through of the event before we get started. After some brief introductions, we'll have a presentation followed by some time for Q&A, but please stick around for some virtual networking at the end of the hour. But first, why are we launching this series? Next slide. The strategy to establish the health tech corridor along Euclid Avenue has resulted in substantial reinvestment, focusing on tech and innovation growth on the RTA bus line. Over the last 10 years, we've seen and reversed decades of demolition and disinvestment. Next slide. And while efforts are underway to build upon these investments, East, 60 strict, East 66th Street is an important asset-rich north-south connection as well. Planning efforts are currently underway to create an inclusive community-based streetscape to connect Midtown and the Huff community. Next slide. This will all culminate in Midtown's Innovation District, a place designed to foster intentional intersections between community residents, nonprofits, and entrepreneurs with faculty, researchers, scientists, and businesses, all catalyzing economic growth and creating economic opportunity for all. Hopefully one day we will hold these sessions in person here at East 66th and Euclid. Next slide. So now let me turn it over to uh, Tegan Horton. Tegan is known as the Tegan, a storytelling and translating professional uh, who focuses her knowledge through data, marketing, and technology. Currently, she is a podcaster and tech innovation strategist. She founded Founders Get Funds, a podcast and newsletter, helping founders get funds together by sharing information on the culture of money. And as also as a co-founder of the Lay of the Land podcast, a weekly podcast ma mapping tech innovation in Cleveland, She's been supporting Cleveland's entrepreneurial community. She is committed to being a bridge for global entrepreneurial community. And Tegan, thanks again for hosting today. Thank you. Hey everyone, welcome to the second event of the Innovation Intersection Series. I am your host for the afternoon, Tegan Horton, also known as The Tegan. As mentioned, I am a podcaster and tech innovation strategist. In 2020, I launched the Founders Get Funds podcast and co-founded the Lay of the Land podcast in Cleveland. And today, we invite John Nottingham, the co-president of Nottingham Spurk, to speak. Nottingham Spurk is a Cleveland-based leading product innovation firm with over 1,300 patents of which 95% have been commercialized. The Nottingham Spurk vertical innovation process has helped client partner companies earn over $50 billion in combined sales. John Nottingham serves on the Cleveland Clinic Board of Trustees, Case Western Reserve University Technology Commercialization Board, boards of Case Western Reserve University Think Box Makerspace, Global Center for Health Innovation, Great Lakes Biomimicry, as well as separate private equity company board of directors. John, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Jacob. Yeah, so I think we'll go ahead and jump into some questions. Um, maybe we could start with a little bit of the history of Nottingham Spark. Um, so how was the building built? Is that somewhat of an interesting story? <laughs> well, uh, you see we're in our rotunda. Uh, the, the building in University Circle uh, was a Christian science church. It was built in 1930. And we acquired it in 
2003 and renovated it and moved in in 2005. So it's a 60,000 square foot, 24-7 uh, innovation center where we create products that uh, you have in your home right now and uh, medical products and industrial products and so forth. So we have a lot of fun doing that. And uh, I, I can launch into uh, some background if you like, some slides. Would that be okay? Yeah, please take it away, John. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, so does everybody see that? Yes. Uh, okay, thumbs up, okay. So um, thank you, Midtown, for uh, letting me uh, uh, speak to this uh, August group. And uh, I'm, gonna, I, I'm really going to be talking about the importance of innovation. And I, I've titled this presentation, Innovate or, Eva Innovate or Evaporate. And those are the, those are the, true, those are the key um, um, issues that everybody that, have, that are in business face today. Uh, there's so much digital disruption. There's so much change. We've all faced the change of COVID in the last year. Uh, and we have, it, we don't have a choice. Uh, people say, well, you know, innovation is risky. Well, the riskiest thing is not to innovate. And so I want to talk about a little bit of our strategy, our background, and just, uh, uh, and, and what it means to Cleveland, Midtown, the Cleveland ecosystem, and so forth. And let me just uh, do this. And Tech, and if you have any questions or if, if anybody want in calling in uh, wants to chat, you can use the chat feature. And if you come up with a, with a question, uh, we'll try to answer them. So let me go into uh, looking at our center. Uh, our center perched at the top of the hill overlooking University Circle and Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals. Um, was the prototype for Severance Hall. This was, this was the impetus for Severance Hall. So there's a lot of, of features. It was built around the same time as Severance Hall, the same Indiana limestone, uh, very cool space. It's a historical landmark. Uh, it's a lot of fun here. Uh, just by the numbers, you know, uh, I've done this my entire career graduated from the Cleveland Institute of Arts Industrial Design Program. And John Spurk and I co-founded the company in a garage. That's all we've ever done. We've never had a real job, never worked for anybody. Uh, and we've just innovated products. I mean, you know, for all this time, we're up to 30, uh, 75 associates. We're in the 60,000 60, square foot building. And as Tegan said, we are responsible with our, with our partner uh, companies for 1,300 patents. Uh, to give you a little perspective, Thomas Edison had 1,100 patents and he's not filing anymore. So um, we have about 100 pending patents right now. But here's the key step. Uh, patents alone aren't gonna get, get you anywhere. You have to commercialize them. The national average of patents, of uh, portfolios of patents is about 5% commercialization. By our vertical innovation process, we have figured a way to get 95% of those 1,300 patents have been commercialized and they're responsible so far for over $50 billion worth of revenue. And, and there are things that you're gonna see uh, that are very familiar with for you. Uh, Tegan, do you have any questions that come to mind as we go through for anybody in chat so far? Well, you, you mentioned something that was interesting to me, that you never had a real job. Um, and I think that innovation allow, is allowing us uh, definitely to start to rethink about what is a job. Um, and so I'm just curious to you, uh, curious to you, what is an inventor uh, as we are talking about creating uh, in an innovative way? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, uh, an, an invention, people say, well, what's, how do you get a patent? Well, it's interesting. It's very simple. Um, there's only one criteria for getting a patent. There's only one, and that is that the and people and I and I say, well, you know, what is what do you need for getting a patent? Well, people say, well, they have a good idea. No, that doesn't get it. 
You have to solve a problem. No, that doesn't get it. You have to like have something useful. No, that doesn't get it. There's only one criteria for a patent, and that is the idea has to be unobvious. That's it. That's, that's the criteria. If you could say, if you could prove that you were the first one to think, uh, you're the inventor is the first one to think of this idea, document it and prove that it's, you're the first one and it's not obvious, the patent office will grant you a patent. That's it. It's so simple. Thank you for that definition. Please continue. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this is this is graduation time, and and uh, I was asked uh, by by a college to give me uh, words of wisdom for the graduating class. And what I came up with is follow your passion, and you'll never work a day in your life. And that's really it. So, what well, what I've done is follow my passion. I think that our group that we put together. Uh, uh, follows their passion and we have a we have a process um, we utilize a process that's that's called vertical innovation in fact we trademark the term vertical innovation it's vertically in integrated innovation and when you have a seamless process from the in invention all the way through to commercialization with without without stopping without pausing that's how you get a 95 percent commercialization rate and it starts with it starts with a discover phase where you do market research. Uh, then you go into design and engineering, then prototyping in house. You build it. You build first a proof of concept of your invention, and then you engineer it to commercialization all the way through to finding a factory, finding a place to to manufacture it, and then reach the consumer whether it's a consumer product, industrial product, and a medical product. And <clears throat> we do it in one vertically integrated space. So our, our space is five stories. It's literally and physically vertically integrated. Uh, and we announced uh, not too long ago uh, uh, an equal partnership with uh, Ernst & Young, uh, which is a very large consulting company uh, known as EY. It was founded in Cleveland, by the way, uh, and uh, we are under construction on our annex, that, that little part to, the, uh, to uh, the side over there, on the EY Nottingham Spurk Innovation Hub. And it's focused on factory 4.0, industry 4.0, advanced manufacturing. And it's, it's under construction right now. Uh, it's going to open at the end of the summer. And uh, it's really going to be really going to be something to see. And 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 in the Cleveland ecosystem, there are going to be companies from all over the world uh, coming to Cleveland to see this center. Uh, as as you may know, EY is a forty billion dollar uh, global company. They have uh, tentacles all over the world, and this Cleveland they have selected Cleveland, Ohio as their uh, is a global center for manufacturing. We were in competition with uh, with other sites around the country, and uh, we had to show that that Cleveland is the best place to be, and that's where it's going to be. Uh, this this is some of uh, that annex is going to be very cool when it's all done. You, you just wait to see it. Uh, we're going to be on the cutting edge of of uh, manufacturing the cutting edge of augmented and, and mixed reality uh, and factory uh, industry 4.0. So let's talk about manufacturing because, you know, the, the, the DNA of Cleveland is really manufacturing. I mean, we, we, we took the lead in the early part of the 20th century, and now we have an opportunity to retake the lead again with factory uh, 4.0. Uh, I always say in the next 10 years, every manufacturer will face disruption from them. Now, you have two choices. Let's say you have a manufacturing company that's really 3.0. Um, what are you going to do? You have two choices. You can react to disruption. You can react and, and, and deal with it, or you can be proactive and use a vertical innovation pro integration process to to uh, be proactive in, in, in looking at, at industry 4.0. Uh, 
Um, I know that your series has talked about innovation. There are really three categories of innovation. One is core innovation. So every company that's in business has a core. Uh, and it's typically incremental improvement to that core because you have to you have to be you have to keep it going. There's another uh, there's another innovation process called adjacent innovation. This is not your core business. It's not your core, but it but it's other markets. It's other products. It's other things that sort of look like your core, but it's not your core. And then there's a third called transformational innovation. This is totally new, totally new markets that don't exist yet. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about all of that. So um, the common allocation of any company that I've found is they spend about 95, 97% of their budgetary uh, for uh, innovation to their core. They spend a 2% for adjacent, maybe 1% for transformational, not very much. This is the ideal. And there's a reason for this ideal. Spend 70% on core, 20% on, on adjacent, and 10% on transformation. Now, why would you do that? This is why you do it. Your return on that innovation of core is only average. It's, it turns it upside down. Your ROI is 10% on core, 20% on adjacent. But look at transformational. That's why you want to spend some time on transformation. This is the ideal budget allocation. So there's, there's ways to do this. So how do you begin? And everybody says, well, you know, I'm, I'm factory 3.0. I want to go to factory 4.0. What do I do? Um, we have put together a very simple innovations assessment and survey that we will offer any company that contacts us for free. This is digital. You can, you can, you can take it, you can fill it out, and it will automatically show you what you're doing well in innovation and where you need to, to uh, punch up your, your staff or punch up your, your, your um, procedures. Uh, it's fascinating. So anybody that would like to do this, let me know, you know, we'll give it to you and you know, nothing, no obligation at all. Just it's something you should do for yourself and your company. And then you have a process. Well, the process is, as you know, as I mentioned, starts with insights. You want to talk to your customer because everybody's got a customer and you want to find out what they're thinking today. So I guarantee what your customer is thinking today, especially in this era of COVID, is different than they were thinking a year ago or six months ago. They have different concerns, they have different pain points, they have different desires. Uh, so you got to know what, what you're doing. So you always start with the customer. Then you go to digital enablement. You can't ignore the internet of things today. You just can't ignore. And everything you do ought to be connected today. And there's, there's technologies that are evolving as we speak that you need to be de in dealing with. Then you go into product design. So you, you, look, at, you, you look at that insight, you look at uh, where things are going, and then you start concepting with, with inventions, with products, with product design. Then you go into engineering. We have one of the world's best prototype facilities in-house where we can test, we can do a, a proof of concept prototype, then go to engineering and just plan for manufacturing. Uh, prototyping is very key, and you got to you got to make it. You got to make one before you make a million of them. And commercialization, you know, uh, you got to make it. You got to make it. You got to make it for the right price and make something that people. And it's got to be safe and it's got to be compliant and everything else you got to deal with. Uh, vertical innovation looks like this. Uh, along to the, the left-hand side is, is in our way we do it, we have a program manager, we have an, an insights team, a design team, engineering, prototyping, manufacturing team. And then we go through discover, design, develop into commercialization and 95% get commercialized and 100% get patents. So you might say, well, what have we done? Well, a few, a few case studies that uh, I'm gonna share with you. Uh, we're, we're well known for uh, the spin brush. 
uh, this, was, this was the first $5 electric toothbrush ever in the world. And we, we uh, started it as a venture company. Um, and, uh, you know, before, before a spin brush, uh, electric toothbrush for 50 to hundred dollars, we came in at five, we created the number one selling toothbrush in the world. We've sold hundreds of millions, it was acquired by P and G uh, and, and it returned up 475 million to investors in this product. So this was one where we literally helped to change the world in this area. Uh, we're right now working uh, with Jacuzzi. Uh, it's the number one spa in the world. We are, uh, we are going to uh, change the game in, in Jacuzzi's right now. Um, they're one of the hottest products in the world. They're gonna double sales next year. Uh, if you try to buy one today, quite often it's a 12 month waiting list. We are going to reinvent the hot tub and spa area. Uh, you may have seen this advertised, it's Navage. It's a Cleveland company, started in Cleveland, founded in Cleveland. Uh, there's some of the manufacturing's done in Brooklyn and Cleveland. Um, and this is a motorized neti pot. Uh, it's the fastest growing product in nasal care and millions have been sold. Um, this is one to watch. Dirt Devil, you've all heard of Dirt Devil. Dirt Devil was a venture company when we started. We helped, uh, you know, of our, of our 1,300 patents, about 100 of them are Dirt Devils. Uh, we went, we helped them grow from about 4 million to about 400 million before it was acquired. Uh, we've done reverse engineering. We've done creative models. Uh, you, you see a Dirt Devil, we probably designed it. Uh, you're probably familiar with the Troy built name. It's, it's a Cleveland company called MTD. One of the products that we did for them is the first modular lawn care product. We have one motor and, uh, um, and all of these attachments. So you can have one motor and snap on a lawn mower, snap on a snow blower, a, you know, a, a, a leaf blower and so forth. Another company started in Cleveland was a technology that we acquired from, from Cornell. Uh, this is a, a, a high disinfectant product. You can put your cell phone in there, a hospital can put their stethoscopes and it kills COVID, it kills germs, it kills bacteria. Uh, this one is one to watch and uh, it's going through clinical trials right now and uh, it's gonna be a big deal. Uh, this, is, this is something you, uh, you may wonder what, what's going on in the ecosystem of Cleveland and with the, uh, the, the group that forms the uh, innovation project. Uh, this is a great story for Cleveland and one that I'm, I'm proud to tell. We acqu acquired this from Case Western Reserve. It was a, it was a technology created uh, primarily or by a, a, a student, uh, uh, Sharu Ramanathan, she's from, from um, uh, India. She did her PhD thesis on her, uh, an invention that basically her, her, her thought was to put 252 EKG sensors on a vest and it would give a cardiologist a map, a digital map of the heart. She, had a, she built a proof of concept prototype, patented it, it worked, it was great, but it was not ready for commercialization. It was, you know, several pounds. It looked like a seat of armor. She'll even say it looked like a torture device almost in a proof of concept. So a venture company was formed called Cardio Insight, uh, licensed the technology. Um, we designed it uh, to be printed electronics on a vest, uh, went through clinical trial and commercialized it. And uh, this was acquired by Medtronic, the large medical company uh, for, uh, and it returned 200 or $120 million to the investors. Medtronic moved their division to Cleveland and components of this are being manufactured in Cleveland. So everybody wins. And I'm saying with the Cleveland Innovation Project, I would love to see 10 more companies like this. Uh, with success stories in, in technology innovation. And I'll go to the next one. 
This one is very similar. We licensed this technology from Case Western Reserve. It was a proof of concept, but it was very large. Uh, it worked in the lab. We started a company called, co-founded and started a company called XA Tech. You've never heard of it, but you will. Uh, it, it is a blood analyzing device. And um, you put a drop of blood in here. You know, you prick your finger, put a drop of blood, and it will immediately tell, talk about your coagulation factor. And something very exciting is we're going through uh, the clinical trial right now is um, one of the one of the issues with COVID is uh, there's there's a phenomenon that happens with some COVID patients where they develop blood clots, and the blood clots cause uh, you know some real problems and uh, fatalities. Some of these, some of the half a million people that have died from COVID has been because of this uh, uh, clot phenomenon. We have just discovered that our, our device works on, on some other areas, but we, we tested it on COVID. It does, it, it does predict uh, for COVID patients, somebody that's had COVID, whether they have this blood clot issue and if they do, they can be taking, you know, prophylactically, they can be taking uh, blood thinners. So we're very excited about this technology. It's going through clinical trial right now, and uh, it's going to be a big deal. And that's it. That's my that's my formal slides. Tegan, uh, what do you think? Wow, that was a lot to unpack. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you so much for sharing. And um, I have a few questions for you, but I know the audience probably does as well. So please send your questions in the chat or the Q&A um, and we'll be sure to ask them. But something that was interesting is your um, vertical innovation approach. Um, and as a marketer or more of an anti-marketer these days, I, I really appreciate kind of a vertical approach to product design. Um, so something that I saw is that you also are bringing together a lot of different minds. So love to hear from you on how design is collaborative and uh, maybe why it should also be multi multidisciplinary. Well, uh, interesting enough, when before we found this building, uh, I got a chance to go uh, through Pixar Studios near San Francisco. And the Pixar building was designed by Steve Jobs because he was one of the co-owners of Pixar. And uh, he designed it to be vertically integrated so that when they're making movies, they have the writers, the animators, the uh, producers, the directors, all in one building, all vertically integrated. And what they did is they, they had a central core, much like our core here, they had a central core. And uh, in their case, they, it was a, a, to get to the restrooms, you had to go through one side and to get to the cafeteria, you went to the other side. And people bumped into each other all day long. And uh, that really resonated with us. So when we saw this building that has a central core and everything stacked around it. So we have our, our MBA researchers, we have our product designers, um, our, our engineers and uh, commercializers all in one room, all in one building. And they're bumping into each other every day. So that's the collaboration. And sometimes we have 10 conference rooms in this building. And sometimes we have intense creative sessions, but other, time, other times, and this is, this is very well known, that, that formal settings can you get, get ideas, but informally bumping into somebody in the hall, say, you know, I was thinking about this, what about that? That is also a good part of, of creativity. Thank you. And it looks very beautiful. Um, looking forward to the expansion as well. Um, something else that you mentioned um, was the importance of customer insights and how if you talk to your customer before COVID, you might want to give them a call again because everyone's values and needs have shifted. And so what is... Um, the importance or the need for human-centric technology-based business outcomes? Well, 
So when we do our process, and our process for creating something from, from scratch all the way to commercialize is about a 12 month process. And through that process, we're always getting back to the customer. So I identify the customer. The reason they call them focus groups is you focus in on a certain demographic, a certain, you know, who's going to buy this thing. So we have in-house focus groups with a two-way mirror and all that kind of stuff. But we also have virtual focus groups now. Uh, we have ethnographic groups where we actually go on site. When we're doing a hospital product, for instance, uh, we'll go in the hospital, we'll go into uh, the operating room, we'll go into the uh, procurement place and we'll find out what are the issues on site. But, you know, you, can, you can't invent in a vacuum. You've got to invent for a customer, you've got to look at their pain points. You got to look what they love, and we have, you got to give them what they want. Yes, and we are all very excited about things that are growing and moving in Cleveland. Uh, can you talk a little bit more in, about the Nottingham Spark Innovation Hub? I know you spoke to a little bit before, but what's some uh, exciting things for us to look out for? Well, you know, this this hub is going to be the center for for technology for um, for manufacturing, and 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 you look at Cleveland. We have manufacturers. You've got single proprietors all the way up to uh, multinational companies, um, and and there's so many great resources. Even in Midtown, I mean, you've got you've got Magnet being constructed there. You've got. Uh, uh, you, You've got university hospitals. You've got you've got um, the Cleveland Clinic, uh, and all of these great institutions that are doing things. We uh, I believe are we're on on the uh, eastern end of this uh, innovation district. Uh, you've got the the opportunity corridor coming in. I mean, it's all very exciting for Cleveland, and we're part of that Cleveland ecosystem. And we're interacting with almost all of the uh, of the practitioners of this this district, and we're very excited about it. Yes, very exciting indeed. Uh, and those listening in are very excited. We have some questions for you. Um, let's start here. Does the Nottingham Spark help innovators only, or do they help uh, those with software ideas? Oh, everything. I mean, everything, again, part of virtual innovation is, is physical and part of it is virtual and part of it is technological. And so it's software, it's firmware, it's, it's, it's devices, it's consumables, whatever it takes to do to, again, we want to, we want to deliver to the consumer what they're, they're looking for. And everything's connected. Yes, everything is connected in today's world that is increasingly uh, being driven by data. Um, something that we hadn't mentioned much was IoT. Um, how are you all implementing that into your solutions as well? Well, part of Industry 4.0, you know, the difference between Industry 3.0 and 4.0 is 3.0, you know, is machines that are maybe computer controlled. But 4.0 is digital, uh, you know, IoT basically. Uh, it's all machines working with each other in a digital twin that all work together, talk together, create data, create supply chain, create all the things that that are in, interconnected. And that interconnectivity is every manufacturer has got to deal with that right now, and uh, uh, it, 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 it's a revolution basically. And one of the reasons we're doing this center with EY is so that people can come in here uh, in, in a creative space. They can bring their teams. We can have a session that we call a wave space where we can just do a process we call diverging. You know, look at all of the things that you can think about. We say we go from mild to wild and then you converge to a solution and then you then you go about commercializing it there's nothing like it in the world and cleveland has it mm -hmm. uh, we have another question here from mike park ceo of the american red cross 
how do you balance the pressure to constantly change and improve equipment and processes with the need to develop proficiency with the equipment and processes, especially if your workforce is predominantly volunteers who are not as comfortable with change? Well, I look at those workers as customers. I mean, if, if we're doing a, some process equipment, which we are right now, uh, our customers are those people. And, and if they're volunteers or if they're, uh, you know, they're temporary or they're, they, they, they don't have time for lots of training, then a digitally enabled um, a process can help them. Let me give you an example. You may have put on uh, something called Oculus for gaming, you know, the, uh, augmented reality, um, augmented reality, virtual reality, and so forth. We're using that. Uh, so, so let's say you're on an assembly line and you're going to have an assembled product that has 15 different pieces. You can put on the, the uh, headset and you can see in front of you, right in front of you with your hands, the assembled product. Only it doesn't exist. It's only virtual. And then you see, you see that the 20 pieces lying on the table that have to be assembled. Well, all you have to do is sort of put them together and, and superimpose it over the, the, visual, the virtual thing. So using augmented reality, you can help train people. You can help people visualize how things are going together. They can help inspect. So we are gonna be using mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality uh, in a real-time basis uh, with an IoT uh, situation in a, in a manufacturing standpoint in our center. We are going, we're going to have a room that's, that's an augmented reality room. It's going to be, uh, because we know of the technology that's evolving that we're putting in today, uh, it, it will probably be the most technologically advanced augmented virtual reality room in the world at the time. So uh, very exciting. Where do you see it? Yeah, that sounds really awesome. Uh, there are also some people curious uh, as to how you know you're, you guys over there are uh, managing COVID. Are you in the office? Is it hybrid? You know, what decision did you guys make? Well, when COVID started, we were, you, you see that disinfection device, which was, uh, which actually kills COVID. And you see that, uh, that blood monitoring device. We were fast tracking both, uh, we were fast tracking medical devices. We were doing uh, face masks and face shields and everything else. We never left the office. We were here the whole time and we have been here the whole, our, our team has been here the whole time. Of course, we've been on Zoom meetings with all our clients, but we've been here. So we've been working. Yeah, that's really positive to hear. Um, and there's also some uh, that are curious about what should people who may have a good product idea but have no business or startup experience do uh, to really pursue their interests? Well, you know what? We vet ideas. I get ideas every week, as you can imagine. And, you know, there's a vetting process. And you have to, you have to figure out how to put, put everything together, vet it, put the team together, Put the uh, investment together and put the put the process together to make it to make it uh, commercializable. Um, you know, everything starts with an idea. It starts with the first step, and uh, there's a process to do it. And we and and we're committed to do it. We're the reason we call this a, an innovation center is that all we do is innovate. All we do is innovate. Yeah, and you spoke a lot about uh, the importance of bringing innovation into your, your business, uh, really into your life. Um, so what are some of the new challenges um, that you see old business models facing that uh, maybe they should be on the lookout for? Yeah, you know, uh, many years ago, I was at, uh, I was at Walmart talking to one of the co-founders of Walmart. And he, he stated, this was many years ago, and he, he, he stated at the time, uh, they had just learned about um, uh, barcode scanners. <laughs> and, and, and supermarkets and stores didn't even know what barcode scanners were, right? 
And he presented, his name is Jack Shoemaker. He presented to a, a conference and he said, uh, and this was a retail conference. He says, there's two types of people, companies in this room. One that are gonna embrace barcode scanners and others that don't. And I would predict that in five years, the one that don't won't be in business. And it was five years later and he says, you know what? They're not in business. They didn't embrace barcode scanning. And so today there's the equivalent of barcode scanning of, of different kinds of technologies. And I'll say the same thing. Uh, some people will be proactive and embrace it and use it. Other pay people will say, well, I'm gonna ignore it for now because I really can't see it for my business today. It's gonna to cost a lot of money. It's gonna make us change. I'll just wait. In five years, those people will be out of business, period, full stop. Wow. It is an ever evolving world. Um, we have uh, another question for the audience, and this may be the last question before we go into some breakout discussions. Um, does Nottingham offer sponsorships or reduce costs to the inventor community? Does Nottingham ever take an investor position with inventors? Yeah, so uh, two-part two question. One is uh, we, we are very supportive of, of, of schools, basically. Um, we supportive of schools, but mostly at the college level. Uh, we have, have supported ThinkBox, as you may know, uh, in Case Western Reserve, ThinkBox is one of the unique things in the world. Wonderful thing we have it here. They actually helped, they benchmarked our, our prototyping facility. We helped them plan ThinkBox. Uh, we supported ThinkBox and uh, we're very excited about what can happen in ThinkBox. But even beyond that, I mean, I think there's lots of things that we're supporting. And yes, we do invest in, in um, some of those things that I showed you, XA Tech and Sterafree and some of those other things uh, we have invested as investors. Uh, we have what we call a shared success model where, which we take our partners and we, we put skin in the game and, uh, and, and share in the ups and downs of, of whatever happens. And uh, it's part of what's exciting about, about innovation. Yeah, it's a roller coaster ride, lots of twists and turns. John, thank you so much for this great conversation on the amazing things that you've done and are working towards in Cleveland. Well, thank you very much, Tegan. Of course. Uh, and so I would like to now invite the audience to please uh, join us for the next event in this series. It will be on June 10th uh, at the same time. And we'll be having a conversation on AI and medicine um, with a special guest from Case Western Reserve University. Um, but this event is not over yet. Uh, we're now going to break out and uh, engage in conversation uh, related to what we've discussed today. So uh, we talked a lot about collaborative design. So what does that mean to you and why should design be multidisciplinary? Uh, being proactive and um, Nottingham Spark leads with independent thoughts. Um, can you describe a little bit about what that means? Uh, can you repeat, repeat that? Yes, Nottingham Spark leads with independent thought. Uh, can you explain a little bit about what that means to you? Well, you know, uh, some of the things that you saw, uh, quite often we have, most, mostly we have partners, you know, companies that come in and they, you know, they have a problem, they have an opportunity and we, and we, and we join together. Sometimes we don't have a partner. Sometimes we say, you know, this problem needs to be solved and nobody's going to partner with us. So we're going to do it. So we're going to start it ourselves. That's how we started the spin brush company. That's how we started uh, some of these other companies that I showed you. Uh, and then, it, and then the momentum starts. So it starts where it starts. And uh, if, if we don't have a partner, we'll just build it ourselves. We'll do it ourselves, start it ourselves. And uh, it goes from there. That's great, thank you. <clears throat> I think that's probably a pretty natural place. Uh, we've got, uh, there are a few more uh, 
items I wanted to just cover with everybody before we we wrap up and end and end the session. Um, as Tegan mentioned, we do have uh, upcoming events in the speaker series. We have uh, on June 10th, we have Dr. Matabushi from Case Western Reserve. Uh, and then on June 30th, we're planning uh, another innovation intersection discussion with uh, our with the president of UH Ventures um, in, this, in the same format. So hopefully we're gonna get, uh, a, and, and you can see the schedule from here on out. If you've received the emails, and seeing some of our marketing where we are uh, trying to get this out uh, further and further into our innovation ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. And just, uh, I, I keep being reminded by our, our marketing team that you can follow us on YouTube or Facebook, LinkedIn and Instagram. Uh, we'll have this session posted up on YouTube fairly shortly and you'll all get a, a video recording uh, of this in, in your email. Uh, a few other things that Midtown is working on right now, we've launched a new neighborhood career hotline services for folks looking for information on job training uh, programs in Cleveland. Uh, we're having a Juneteenth celebration at the Dunham Tavern that's being planned uh, um, on, on June 19th. Um, also next week, uh, food trucks are back in Midtown. So if you're anxious to be back in the office and want to stop by for a sandwich, uh, starting next, next Tuesday and every Tuesday this summer, we'll have food trucks at Colonel Young Park at East 46th and Prospect. And lastly, just as a part of, you know, our community conversations on real estate development in an ever-changing neighborhood, we've launched a, a series called Real Estate 101 where we've had a few sessions already free online, uh, virtual for anyone to attend who wants to, to join um, uh, and, and, and learn more about the real estate uh, process. So again, these videos are, are available on YouTube at, uh, at our Midtown Cleveland channel. So feel free to uh, check any of those out. All right, next slide. And just uh, thank you again to everyone for attending. Thank you, Tegan. This was a great session. Thank you, John. Uh, it was really wonderful to have you and, and to hear your thoughts on uh, the innovation community. So uh, with that, I'll say thanks everybody for joining and have a great day.